Hello and welcome back. For this segment of our presentation, I'm joined by my dear friend and fellow Uplift admin, Kara Dawson. How are you today, Kara? I'm fine, thanks, Leo. How are you? Doing great. Thank you. Great. Uh, for our first slide, we are going to be talking a little bit about knowledge. Kind of cool. Uh, this slide comes from uh, a wonderful book by the Hafens called Faith is Not Blind with some minor adaptations and, and uh, our own uh, in insight from our experiences here. Uh, and so we're going to look first at this uh, continuum of knowledge. So as we go through life, you know, when we're born, we have basically no knowledge, right? We just are completely dependent on our parents and loved ones, uh, our caretakers. And then as we grow, we just continue to gain knowledge. Uh, and hopefully, uh, of course, there are some cases where knowledge stops and and the arrow stops and someone stops learning. But uh, but for the most part, I think everybody continues to learn throughout their life. So this is a, continu a life continuum here. And we're going to look to see what happens uh, along this continuum. So we have three stages. So we'll look at the first one here. Uh, could you read this for us, Kara? Sure. Stage one, idealistic simplicity. Ideal is real. And that's characterized by black and white thinking, being innocent and untested, childlike optimism and loyalty, a primary view of, of scripture, fully trust all leaders as Christ-like, revelation is God's pure word, all doctrines are eternal, and all policies are from God. Mm -hmm. So have you personally, Cara, have you noticed in your own life uh, I guess where where you maybe have been part of this stage early on in life uh, with the simple faith, uh, easy to trust, uh, that sort of thing. Any of these yes. bullet points from your past or from other people that you've noticed uh, that are in stage one? Oh, definitely. I think that everyone goes through the stage when they grow up in the church, um, as I did. I'm a third generation member. Uh, and my children are fourth generation members, so I'm very aware of, of um, this as a stage. Um, and like everyone, I went through primary and seminary, uh, the youth program, institute, and um, really I think that's the stage that, that, uh, that most people start in. I, I, I think it would be unusual not to start in that stage. Um, and certainly, I think my personality type lends to black and white thinking, but I'm learning to challenge that type of thinking. Mm. Um, and I'm a naturally optimistic person, so uh, that that comes easily to me. I'm mm -hmm. also a trusting person. Um, so, yeah, so these are these are things that we have a natural tendency to be as children, um, mm -hmm. especially when we're mm -hmm. we're taught uh, some of those as principles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely not a negative thing, the the things that we learn here and we experience here. Um, That's right. But we're, not, we're not necessarily, ne not, a ne not a negative place to be necessarily, but uh, there are some things yeah. here that can present challenges for sure. Exactly. And we're, we're told to have a childlike faith, so that's a good starting point. And uh, mm -hmm. we're told that, um, that we have to humble ourselves and become as little children. So yeah, as you say, it's not a it's not a negative thing at all, but it's it's it is it is only a starting point. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm okay. So before we move on to this other, uh, we have a blank space here, so we're going to see what happens. But I, I'll explain, I guess, just briefly what we mean by idealistic simplicity, just to make sure that's clear. But it's an ideal world. Uh, everything makes sense, fits into to boxes uh, cleanly, and and we aren't really presented with any challenging information. Uh, when we talk about mm -hmm. ideal is real, this is a little bit difficult to explain what we mean here, but essentially it means is, is our ideal world is our reality. Uh, things are pretty simple, pretty easy. We have uh, faithful friends and family around us who all believe and we sing the songs in primary. Uh, it's, it's just easy to believe um, our ideal uh, which is which is uh, what we're experiencing, what we, we expect, 
what we like, uh, what we're used to is really our, is our reality. There's really no gap between the two. And that will, that's maybe a little unclear right now, but we, hopefully as we move through this, we'll see what we mean, but go ahead. I see a little, uh, uh, that a little bit like the Garden of Eden stage um, where everything mm -hmm. seems ideal and seems perfect, but, uh, and you don't, you don't really know what's beyond that. But um, yeah. yeah, I think as we get towards the other stages, we'll realize that um, the complexity um, that exists outside of the Garden of Eden is necessary for growth. Yep, and we'll move to that next stage. We'll help to clarify a little bit what we mean by, I, I mentioned the word gap, so we'll see that here. So if you sure. want to read this to, uh, for us, uh, just in a second, I'll explain. As we have knowledge going along in life, we, are, we begin to be presented by challenges. So as a, as a young teenager, you know, what are some of the challenges to faith? A lot of our teens today, our youth today, experiencing a lot of challenges aimed at faith and, and, and the church. And so these challenges, life challenges, all kinds of things will start to hit. And those challenges can, I guess, would typically increase at some point. Uh, challenges as a child, you know, I, don't, I didn't get enough cereal or <laughs> I woke up and I woke up too early, you know, and I, I'm still tired. You know, I have, I have these three little children in my home and, and their challenges are very real to them. I'm not trying to minimize the, their, their challenges, but the challenges grow in scope and size um, and complexity over time um, as you get older um, and our capacity to handle challenges should increase, hopefully. But this idea of challenges really starting at some point in our lives, real challenges and starting to increase over time uh, is the idea here that this continuum also goes along with our knowledge. They both go, they, they run in parallel. So anyway, you go ahead and read stage two for us, Cara. Sure, stage two is complexity or the gap. Reality opens our eyes, tempered by ambiguity, faces uncertainty with skepticism, expands view of scripture, observes fallible leaders. What is revelation? Notices changes in teaching, notices humanity and policy. Mm -hmm. Anything resonate it's really there? Really like coming out of yeah. yeah I, I was just thinking how much that was that is like the the fall of Adam, the um, the real world starts to kick in, uh -huh. and uh, <laughs> I think this happens to to us all as we um, go to school, as we start to learn about the world around us, as we start to bump up against other people and other world views, other other religions, other points of view, um, we start to realize that the world's actually a very big place. Um, when, we, when we're growing up, it's, it's a comfortably small place and mm -hmm. um, we're, we're comfortable in that. And I think even for people who, who haven't grown up in the church, I think this is a stage that we go through. It's definitely um, it's an uncomfortable stage. It's a stage where you start to question um, the very roots of, of everything that you took for granted mm -hmm. but uh, but it is a necessary stage I've definitely been through it myself starting as a teenager and uh, I, I I was a teenager in the 1980s and um, there was a lot of um, a lot of material being distributed by different or mostly by faith groups there wasn't really a lot of opposition coming from within the church at that stage but um, but they, there was certainly um, uh, that was the, the era of the God Makers film, for example, and I had friends who attended other Christian churches, and so I really had to dig deep to discover what I actually believed. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a fairly uncomfortable stage, and I think I've been through it repeatedly. I think this is not just a one-way process; it's something that you keep mm -hmm. returning mm -hmm. to, but keep keep working through. And I think that's the principle of conversion as well. Uh, that's when mm -hmm. we we really um, continue to dig deep. It's not just something we achieve once and then and then we're fine. But uh, it's a journey. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm yeah. Yeah. Well said. Uh, I agree. Uh, that 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 uh, type of complexity that you experienced uh, and that we all experience in life uh, creates a gap. So we have this. The stage is, is termed the gap. 
and the gap meaning the between ideal and our reality. So our ideal life that we grew up with as a child begins to not fit as well as what's happening to us. Uh, we start to experience a lot of pain, some of us a lot of suffering, a lot of uh, family issues, uh, confusion. Uh, doubt is a big one for us in Uplift, we talk about that. So these, this complexity really opens our eyes to the reality that our ideal world and what we considered ideal to be actual, to, to be actual reality, that we would always be in a nice, a warm, loving home with parents who believe in God, um, or uh, we have a stable job or whatever it is, once uh, the reality becomes not the ideal anymore, where we're, fi we're finding we're facing some, some gap there, then we enter this stage of complexity and, and we are, like we said, our eyes are opened. Um, we notice ambiguity. We begin to face that uncertainty with skepticism because our trust can be violated in different ways as we experience complexity and we begin to be skeptical. Uh, you know, I wasn't told this or so-and-so harmed me. Um, you know, these kind of things begin to make us more skeptical in life. Scripture can be tested and tried. Uh, we begin to see critical scholarship of, of the Bible and of the Book of Mormon, uh, those kind of things. And we begin to see Scripture differently. We begin to see our leaders as actually fallible. <laughs> We don't just talk about it. We actually see it in real life. Someone, a local leader, or we see a general leader that we don't agree with. Uh, revelation, the process of revelation is something that can be challenging to understand. Is it a pure download, you know, where a, a prophet goes into the upper room of the temple and, and vo in a clear voice it gives him exactly what words to write? Probably not. Mm -hmm. he, he doesn't work like that. It's a very... <laughs> time intensive and laborious and arduous process. Uh, so and again, these, these are all kinds of things that we deal with in the world of complexity. And like you said, it's not linear because, you know, we're, we're at, we are going, it's represented as a, as a linear, in a linear format from no knowledge, no challenges to, to increasing. But, but there are, there are opportunities, I think, for coming back and revisiting complexity. It can, it can hit it in different ways and in, uh, in different times of our life. So, mm. I think it's also um, true to say that once you're in stage two, there's no going back to stage one. And, uh, yes, and you know, right. sometimes we long to go back to the Garden of Eden, but it's not. Um, that's not the way that it works. Unfortunately, you can only move forward. But mm -hmm. stage two, um, I think there's there's definitely um, a a fairly uh, loose sort of connection between stage two and stage three. So I think that those, so you can certainly move backwards and forwards between those at, at different um, times. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But yeah, we, we can long for the innocence of our childhood. We can long for the time when we, when everything was simple in our minds. Um, but once you have that complexity, then I think um, you're stuck with it. You have to deal with it, uncomfortable mm -hmm. though it may be. Mm -hmm. Yep. Very good. Uh, do you want to read this stage for us as well? Sure. So stage three is simplicity beyond complexity. And I think the Havens described this really well in their book, uh, Faith is Not Blind. Um, so here the real is ideal. And in stage three, someone loves the real while seeking the ideal. And in this stage, we embrace ambiguity skepticism is a tool not a destination scripture is understood and loved in this stage we ideally we navigate leader humanity and I think also we could it's important to do that with uh, charity and compassion and we recognize imperfect and interactive revelation so we, we recognize that there's a human process involved in revelation as well as a divine process the history of doctrine is valued, and we anticipate change with courage. Mm -hmm. And I love that last one because when we think about it, change has brought us everything that's good in the church, mm -hmm. and uh, change changes the whole thing behind the restoration. And the restoration is ongoing. 
Mm-hmm. So I love mm-hmm. that that um, we we have a church with continuing revelation, and that means mm-hmm. that we're not static, even if we would hope for for things not to change. Change is mm-hmm. good. Mm-hmm. I agree. The, uh, the to explain a little bit further about the the theory behind this stage is the Hafens describe this stage of simplicity beyond complexity is where we're we're reaching a new type of simplicity and uh, and also when we talk about real as ideal we mean that the reality that we've now identified is this gap is widened between our ideal and our our reality this huge gap that we've noticed the real the reality of our world uh, we begin to embrace it uh, and the negativity that we experience we learn how to process that appropriately we're going to talk about negativity later on in this in this in the slides but we we take the reality of our of our lives and where we're at and we learn how to love it and uh, and allowing the ideal our ideal idealistic view of our lives what we expected to really play kind of catch up so we kind of close that gap by bringing our reality in line with our ideal world the reality is really isn't going to change it's just it's a, like a it's a brutal hard cold fact of life it's just complexity is here to stay negativity is here to stay we're going to have all kinds of issues it's what we do with that reality and how we view it uh, if we're going to be positive about it or negative about it really allows us to close that gap and say this is my reality but i'm going to make it ideal so that hopefully explains mm-hmm. what we mean there by closing that gap and making those two more aligned and, and i don't think you can ever really make every part of our reality ideal like we're going to have things that just blow us out of the water and we're just knocked off our feet for a while so we're not mm-hmm. we're not expect we shouldn't expect to have uh, those two perfectly aligned but we should expect that gap to slowly close as we have we develop uh, good ways to to process the information and the, and the difficulties we face like we can embrace the ambiguity for example that helps to uh to because we're going to have an ambiguity but we can learn how to embrace it we can learn how to use skepticism mm. as a tool instead of something that uh, we we finish with uh, we can look at that in a different light instead of something that uh, we we're afraid of we can use it uh, appropriately we begin to understand scripture better uh, the even the complexities the issues that we find in scripture the nuance that's there all of that can be become a beautiful thing instead of a scary thing so anyway just a few examples there in stage three mm. that's great leo and um I think in terms of the plan of salvation, as the first stage was the Garden of Eden, the second stage is, was the fall, and stage three is the rest of the journey, really. It's, um, it's our journey of, of um, ascension really back into God's presence. It's, it's recognizing the complexity, but it's moving beyond it with faith. Um, so, mm-hmm. yeah, I think that's a helpful way of framing it too, and that's certainly what I've found, is that your, your faith can be far greater in stage three than it ever was in stage one even though you thought you had faith faith is is not um to have a certain knowledge but it is to um to have trust in the face of uncertainty and until you have that uncertainty you can't you can't have true faith so so stage three is although it's um more complex it it leads to faith and um, mm-hmm. that's been my experience yeah yeah the the specific example I wanted to share here from my own experience my own journey is after I was recovering from my faith crisis those years ago I remember sacrament meeting uh, starting to be less bland uh, number one I started to say oh well maybe this is actually true uh, I was perhaps wrong in my atheism um, and mm-hmm. my eyes began to be um, opened in a different way, in a, in a new light, as I was in sacrament meeting. And I remember some very quiet, simple moments of, of worship uh, where it was just me and my Savior, uh, thinking about him and praying and asking for healing and asking for strength. Just such a simple interaction. I mean, I was mm-hmm. just sitting there 
and and thinking about looking at the sacrament table, imagining uh, his his body there, thinking about what the emblems represent, um, appreciating the service that was being rendered to me by these young men, um, looking at my wife next to me, realizing the blessings that I have. It's it was just a beautiful beautiful simple moments in the sacrament where I wasn't being triggered by uh, you know someone giving a strange talk or even by primary songs. I was triggered by primary songs for a long time uh, because mm -hmm. of, of the distortions that I was, was run through um, about mind control, manipulation, that sort of thing. Uh, and so all of that difficulty that I'd faced that was, was swirling around in my mind for all that time through very serious, very dark period of time of, of doubt, very serious doubt, began to be lifted as I had that simple interaction uh, reminding me of how of my simple faith from before it was just a very simple experience of trusting love of light from my savior in the sacrament meeting so that's just my experience but that's when I kind of returned to to simplicity beyond the complexity mm. was in sacrament meeting yeah that's beautiful um, and I think that it really all does come back to the savior doesn't it so we're, that's what we're taught in primary uh, mm -hmm. We're taught to love him and to trust him, but it's not until we've moved, until we've comprehended that complexity um, that we can truly return to the Saviour. Um, and it, that really is, it, it really is simple, but but it can't it can't remain as childlike as it was to begin with. Um, no. I think our faith has to mature in that way, and you've described that perfectly. Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely deeper. My faith is today than it was. I, I, I. Both types of faith are beautiful. My my simple faith as a missionary, for example, very black and white thinker as a missionary, <laughs> just <laughs> just yeah. stating you know plainly and truthfully the church is true and and just to have these very simple ideas in my mind that were like axioms of of truth that I I would never relinquish. Um, and yeah. that was beautiful too, but, but the, the, the beautiful part for me that's even more beautiful, my, expa my expanded view, uh, it's, called, it's an expansive uh, view of the restored gospel for me, is returning to this simple worship. Uh, it's just a simple prayer, a simple mm. partaking of a simple piece of bread, um, a small kiss uh, between me and my wife of love, um, mm. you know, uh, teaching my child, one of my children about uh, the first vision and these simple things that we talk about um, in the church have renewed my appreciation for these things. And so there's elements here that have been been carried through, bring being brought back to my remembrance uh, through mm -hmm. the Holy through the Holy Spirit. I'm able to remember the beauty that was here, uh, and it's cut through like a knife, right straight yeah. through that that stage of complexity where the that darkness that was surrounding me. Um, and it's a beautiful thing to see these little, these little uh, lights uh, shimmering through the darkness that I experienced. And I just love that, that I'm now able to say I'm, I'm back to this sim simple stage again, but it's a different type of simplicity. That's right. And it's, it's a, um, a piece, piece that you don't have in stage two, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In stage two, there's a lot of pain, confusion, doubt, fear. All of those emotions come flooding in on you, um, but really, stage three is like a light, or like a, a comfort, like a, a warmth. Um, it's mm -hmm. not a certainty, but it's a. Um, it, it's it, you feel this spiritual confirmation of the the very basic things that you really do know deep in your soul. Mm -hmm. And the other things become less important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's how it feels for me as well. So I've been through my life's journey. I've mm -hmm. returned to to really looking at what's deeply important to me. What's what are the fundamental aspects of my faith? I even went and wrote them down. Uh, I wrote down the things that I absolutely trust and believe and those are the things that anchor my faith and it's it really all does come back to the savior mm -hmm. 
I, I, I very much agree. And speaking of uh, complexity, we're, getting, we're now going to talk about a community for perpetual complexity and uh, try to explain what we mean by this. Uh, so uh, in Uplift, we know that we have a community that's built around a, a few principles, uh, faith in God uh, and, uh, and trying to listen and learn from each other about our journeys, um, uh, trying to support each other in our healing. A lot of uh, our, our process and what we're trying to do in Uplift is actually quite similar to some of the other communities that are out there. Um, but uh, there's a few key differences uh, between what we do in Uplift and what some of the other places online and other places you can go for, for support, uh, the differences between our, our communities. And so <clears throat> this community, what we're we calling perpetual complexity, it's a place where unfettered belief deconstruction is welcome and a different type of simplicity is pursued. And so uh, we'll, we'll kind of show you what we mean uh, by that. Um, and so these, uh, these screenshots of, from different places online, some different organizations uh, and communities, uh, different articles that you can read, it, we want to share this uh, by, to help with um, increasing our knowledge, our awareness of, of uh, what this is. And uh, in no way do we mean to, to hurt anyone or to um, demean anyone. Uh, in fact, we, we do appreciate um, the sincere motives that many people have in these communities to reach out to active members of the church. Uh, you can see this, this, uh, this woman here has a video about why she left the Mormon church and how she did it. Really, this is a call to action uh, for help, uh, rallying a cry from many people who have felt they've been victimized and hurt and, and are in pain because of their experience in the church. And uh, so we understand that that motive is there to help and to, to heal. Um, but uh, our opinion is that this is not a place for simplicity in Jesus Christ, simplicity in the restored gospel, uh, in faith. Uh, the, these places often, uh, will, people will tend to gravitate toward agnosticism or atheism. And if that's the course that you wish to pursue uh, and you feel like that is your truth, uh, or perhaps you've come, you're coming from these places, just know that uh, Uplift is very different and we have a different type of simplicity. The simplicity that we offer in Uplift, again, is, is based on Jesus Christ, is simple faith uh, uh, in him and, and also in the church uh, and being able to re reconcile our concerns uh, in in these other communities, that's not pursued uh, in, the same, in the same way, I guess you could say. Simplicity is pursued, but if you go back to the analogy of the shelf, the broken shelf that we talked about in an earlier presentation, you have a bunch of books that have fallen down and that have created a big mess. And when you leave the church and uh, leave this behind, a lot, of your un un or a lot of your questions go unanswered and those books just remain on the floor and it's a big mess and you can lock the door and walk away. Um, a lot of people stick around, you know, near the shelf and, and will, and will um, you know, pick up their books and, and, and uh, try to explain to people why they were hurt and why they are in pain um, and don't really leave the books alone. They, they continue to visit those for a long time afterwards. Um, but some people are able to just walk away and that kind of simplicity is really what, what's at the root of this community. They're trying to, uh, forgive and forget and, and let go and move on. And, uh, and if, if that's the kind of simplicity, again, that you're, you're wanting to do is just to let go of everything and, and to forget about it all, then I, we wish you the very best in your, your journey of healing away from uh, that bitterness that, uh, that so many people can experience. Um, and if, if not, if you're looking for simplicity in Christ and God and faith and to be able to return to full belief, then Uplift is a, is a great alternative to this community. And so this is basically a, a slide to help us to understand uh, who these people are a little bit more. It's good for us to know about these different websites. Uh, some of them are, are very um, heavily populated. A lot of attention is here. 
uh, and uh, and it's good for us to know who these people are and what they're trying to do. Um, and uh, so, because knowledge is power, as we've said. So anyway, we can move on. Um, and this is what we're calling is the alternative approach to that community of perpetual complexity. And so we'll just look as we come, as these come up, um, Kara, can you tell us a little bit about uh, why you like being, is, I guess, in part of this uh, different community that's, that's about, it's focused on faith? Yeah, sure. So for me, I need to have two aspects to my faith, um, the mind and the heart. And I think it's clear in scripture that the spirit speaks to both our mind and our heart. So we can't just blindly believe we need information to support our faith. Um, and that is that is really what stage three is all about, is using the mind and the heart together to come to a sense of truth. And for me, a lot of these, these uh, organizations that you've listed there do that for me. Um, so they provide the, the mind aspect. Um, I became involved with Fair Mormon a couple of, you know, two, two or three years ago because I admire the work that they do. I think it's needed. It's not everything we need, but it certainly helps to clarify some of the uncertainty around the, uh, the um, difficult aspects of church history and doctrine. And it provides a counter argument or at least some, a, an, another source of information to balance out um, the, the critical sources. Uh, the Interpretive Foundation, I find, is a really good resource as well. And w I've used a lot of Interpretive Foundation resources in <clears throat> pardon me, preparing Sunday School lessons. Uh, Saints Unscripted, I have, um, I have young adult children and they love <clears throat> Saints Unscripted. It, it really appeals to the, the younger generation and um, it, they've got a huge amount of energy and um, enthusiasm for their project. Book of Mormon Central I absolutely love and I can thoroughly recommend all of their resources. They, they, I've been to visit their, uh, their studio and they're great people and uh, they, they're doing fantastic work. Joseph Smith Papers is an ongoing project and I have a huge amount of admiration for what they're doing. Um, LDS Perspectives podcast, I absolutely loved that too and I even met Laura Harris-Hales at the Uplift Gathering um, this year and um, she's a, a wonderful woman and um, I think that that podcast is, uh, is, is excellent, Pro uh, provides a really faithful perspective on some difficult issues. Um, again, Joseph Smith's Polygamy is a good resource if that's something that you struggle with and um, that is also the Hales work. I have their book, which was kindly given to me by Laura. Planted is an excellent book that I've really enjoyed reading that. It's, it's been a big factor in my journey. And uh, yeah, I, I really recommend that book too. Um, Faith Matters Foundation is, is quite new, but they have a lot of excellent podcasts to listen to um, the book Saints is is a really groundbreaking thing as far as I'm concerned it's um, providing a very accessible description of the events of early church history and uh, is, is available to everyone via the Gospel Library app which I think is fantastic so it's absolutely free um, and I have a hard copy as well, which I enjoyed reading of the uh, the first volume, but the second volume is also now out. Um, and Gospel Topics Essays, um, they, they are essential. I really feel that anyone who's trying to move beyond stage two needs to study and, and become very familiar with the Gospel Topics Essays. As a Gospel Doctrine teacher, I was constantly promoting those essays for, as a source of information. They're very scholarly, they're balanced. Um, not everyone likes them, of course, and they can be challenging, but they are a very uh, well-researched source of information. So that's, again, something that I thoroughly recommend. Um, 
I see you've also got um, Rough Stone Rolling down there by Richard Bushman. And again, that is a very challenging book to read. It is huge and incredibly well researched and well referenced. Um, Richard Bushman is a is an amazing scholar with an, an encyclopedic knowledge of the Prophet Joseph Smith. And he really, this is a no holds barred biography, but Richard Bushman has very much a faithful approach to to addressing the issues around Joseph Smith and his life. He he presents um, all of the issues, but then he he presents them in a faithful way from a perspective that a believing member um, should be able to to work with and understand. Um, yeah, and Wendy Elrich is a is a wonderful author as well. Um, so there's just some really great resources there. Um, Maxwell Institute, the uh, Encyclopedia of Mormonism, I can, re and the Mormon and Gay website as well. So there's there's just some great resources. There there undoubtedly are some there uh, at least that haven't been included, but are also excellent. I think that um, I've heard uh, something that I think is very valid, which is that when people struggle with their faith, it's often not because they haven't studied enough, at least not, it's often not because they have studied too much, it's because they haven't studied enough. And so if you're serious about strengthening your faith, then study more, really dig into it, but choose the right sources, choose sources that are, are not aiming to undermine your faith, choose sources that are aiming to strengthen your faith and you'll find them to be a massive ally in your return to the complexity, the simplicity beyond complexity. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a wonderful review. And, and you know what? We didn't, act, just so we know, we can say this, that, that Car, you didn't really prepare for this slide. Uh, we just, you're just a wealth of knowledge. You've, you've, you've studied and, and you've been working through uh, through a lot of these topics for, for a long time. And so just a plug for you as well. I mean, uh, you're in uplift and, and, and you often help uh, with, with all kinds of uh, questions. And, and so look, I mean, if you're listening to this, uh, look for Cara in uplift and, and I'm sure she would be willing to talk with you. And, and she, uh, we've also, yeah. we've also been doing small groups uh, so people can, ask questions in private uh, and, uh, and and you run that small group uh, part of mm -hmm. lift so yeah so yeah so you're 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 always happy to to help yeah, yeah. If, um, if someone has particular questions that we can't answer in the general uplift group or if they're very personal whatever we can set up a small group just to help um, with with any issues um, if somebody needs one-on-one -on -one or one to small group um, ministering, then we're happy to help out with that. Mm -hmm. I love that approach that we offer in Uplift. It's just, it's simple, but it it is a beautiful offering. Uh, we, we want to connect with people. We want to love people, uh, give you a, a virtual hug. If we can meet people in real life, then we love to do that. But we just want to be there and to help people to, to not feel alone. So hopefully this slide gives gives you, the listener out there, a feeling of light and of love and of hope that there are good places to go, um, helpful places to go. If you are intending to rebuild your faith again, this is meant we're meaning to present this as an alternative. Uh, we're not saying this is the only way to go. Um, you know, that's for you to decide as the listener, um, try to sense how you feel. Uh, uh, and we've talked about epistemology early on. See if this, if this is a beautiful, logical way to approach faith and approach the church. If, if this makes sense to you and begins to taste good, as we learn in Alma 32, uh, and begins to grow and we begin to feel like it's a good seed, then we encourage you to stay with it uh, and keep fighting for to be part of this community. We, we want you to be here. We want to welcome you with open arms and, and, and allow you to stay with us and to heal from uh, any trauma that you've experienced. Um, 
And if you're coming to us from the previous slide, <laughs> the other community, uh, the, the communities that are out there, uh, and, and you con have concerns about what we're trying to do here, uh, please ask and, and let us know what your, what your concerns are and we'll do our very best by, by using some of these excellent resources, excellent scholarship, uh, and, and faithful and brilliant members of the church who love you uh, to help to answer those questions. And we hope that that approach will be suitable and, and, uh, uh, and, and pleasing to you. Uh, yeah, and can I also mention one other resource, Leo? Yes, um, yes. That yeah. I find is really good. Um, it's actually offered through Fair Mormon, but it's called Mormon Scholars Testify. And, um, you know, yes. because I have mm -hmm. a, a, a lot of background in, in the university system, um, I, I really um, benefit from reading the, the testimonies of, <coughs> excuse me, of um, scholars who, who are well educated but come from a place of faith and are able to balance their academic knowledge with with their faith. And so I find that is a is a wonderful resource and you can just pick off a testimony and read it and um, there's so much light and knowledge that comes flooding in when you do that. Oh yeah, the list is long. It's hundreds of Faithful it scholars, is. Uh, all all around the world, I believe, are are listed there. Uh, That's right. I've loved reading some of those testimonies and their experiences. A lot of them really are great case studies in that uh, complexity model stages of belief that the Hafens produced. It's uh, you can see that's that's interesting because you can see a lot of the people who are behind these websites and these books um, have. Uh, gone through this process of, of dealing with complexity and have come out the other side with a very simple and sure foundation of, in faith in Jesus Christ. And so we, I guess, collectively together, you and I and all these scholars that are out there, we testify to, to you, the listener, that it is possible to, to utilize these sources. Uh, they are generally trustworthy. Uh, they are not meant to uh, distort your view to lead you astray, uh, to cause additional pain. They're here to minister to you, to add light to your understanding, to your life. And so we just encourage people again, with all of our, all the love that we have to stick with us and to keep searching here and focus most of your time if you can on here. Uh, if you need to be balanced in your research and continue to go to the other communities, uh, then, then you do you, of course, we can't stop people from doing that, but, we hope that you'll feel better here. That's our goal. We want you to feel lighter and feel happier and feel more at peace here um, with us. So that's our invitation. Yep, totally agree. Okay. So moving on, uh, we'll now talk again. We're going up and down like a roller coaster <laughs> on our slides. <laughs> we have some positive, some negative. We've had a great positive slide. Now we're going to talk about uh, a little bit uh, more negative thing here, but actually it ends up being positive, so it'll be okay. So this is one of my favorite thinkers uh, that I've appreciated learning from. Uh, his name is Choyum Trungpa Rinpoche, quite a mouthful, but uh, he, he, Rinpoche uh, I believe stands for holy one or, um, or master, someone that deserves respect. And he is a Tibetan Buddhist master uh, has passed away, but uh, amazing uh, man uh, in his uh, understanding of, at least in this aspect of negativity. Uh, and so I, we'll just talk, we'll just read through his, uh, his statement here is from, from one of, I think, one of his uh, uh, books that he's written. So uh, we'll go ahead and read this and we can take turns on this part if you'd like. Cara, do you want me to start? Is that okay? Sure. All right, uh, and you can read the next slide. <clears throat> we all experience negativity, the basic aggression of wanting things to be different than they are. We cling, we defend, we attack. And throughout there is a sense of one's own wretchedness. And so we blame the world for our pain. This is negativity. We experience it as terribly unpleasant, foul smelling, something we want to get rid of, but if we look into it more deeply, it has a very juicy smell and is very alive. 
Negativity is not bad per se, but something living and precise connected with reality. Go ahead. Negativity breeds tension, friction, gossip, discontentment, but it is also very accurate, deliberate, and profound. Unfortunately, the heavy-handed heavy interpretations and judgments we lay on these experiences obscure this fact. These interpretations are negative negativity, watching ourselves being negative and then deciding that the negativity is justified in being there. This negativity seems good-natured with all sorts of good qualities in it, so we pat its back, guard it, and justify it. Or if we are blamed or attacked by others, we interpret their negativity as being good for us. In either case, the watcher, by commenting, interpreting, and judging, is camouflaging and hardening the basic negativity. Yeah. Uh, pretty good. We'll keep going, and then we can stop and talk at the end here. And I'll read this one. So negative negativity refers to the philosophies and rationales we use to justify avoiding our own pain. We would like to pretend that these evil and foul-smelling aspects of our lives and our world are not really there, or that they should not be there, or even that they should be, or even that they should be there. So negative negativity is usually self-justifying, self-contained. It allows nothing to pierce its protective shell, a self-righteous way of trying to pretend that things are what we would like them to be instead of what they are. Okay, next slide, go ahead. The secondary com commenting kind of intelligence of double negativity is very cautious and cowardly, as well as frivolous and emotional. It inhibits an identification with the energy and intelligence of basic negativity. So let's forget about justifying ourselves, trying to prove to ourselves how good we are. The basic honesty and simplicity of negativity can be creative in community as well as in personal relationships. Basic negativity is very revealing, sharp and accurate. If we leave it as basic negativity, rather than overlaying it with conceptualizations, then we see the nature of its intelligence. Negativity breeds a great deal of energy, which clearly seen becomes intelligence. When we leave the energies as they are with their natural qualities, they are living rather than conceptualized. They strengthen our everyday lives. Mm -hmm. So, uh, initial thoughts there. It's quite, quite a lot uh, to take in, but what do you think, Cara? Yeah, that's, uh, that's really interesting. I've actually never read that before, uh, before now, and so I'm coming at it completely yeah. Um, completely fresh, but and I, I'm not sure I even completely understand that. I probably need to read it a few more times. But <laughs> that's an interesting way of seeing negativity. So he can see. So I think we we tend to, in our Western culture to think of negativity as entirely negative, for lack of a better uh -huh. word. Yeah. Um, as entirely um, something to be avoided. Um. And and something that we want to stay stay as far away as possible from. But here I think he's talking about how negativity may may actually be a tool if we use it in the right way. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. That's basically <laughs> you could have written this yourself. You know, you are a, officially well, a Tibetan Buddhist master. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I've been working on it. <laughs> you got but it. I yeah. Think that, um, it's it's true to say that it's not it's not the feeling it's what we do with it and yeah. if we stay in cycles of of negativity and and allow them to drag us down then we're we're really not learning the lessons that that we're we're here to learn um we need to use that negativity as a as a stepping stone to greater i guess a Tibetan monk would say enlightenment. Uh -huh. Would that be right? Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, that's really that's exactly right. So we love yeah. mindfulness in uplift. We love being present, learning how to observe our thoughts, not become our thoughts. Um, we we try to look for truth in all areas of 
the world, good, good places. And this is one place I feel like we've got some truth to dig out of here. Um, and yes. what you've said is, is very, very good, very, very well, very well stated, a good summary. Um, I love the description of negativity being juicy, uh, you know, uh -huh. of having a great deal of energy. It's like, it's, it's looking at it in a neutral way. Um, as something really negative comes through our lives, uh, we can look at it as a neutral, uh, just a normal part of life, uh, these negative things. And of course, we, we're not here to minimize abuse or what we consider to be a, a traumatic experience like in a church building someone's listening and has been feels like they've been victimized and um, we're not trying to minimize or demoralize anybody for uh, experiencing these very negative things and, and feeling like you've been lied to etc by church leaders we, we we're not here to to diminish that experience we're, we're simply saying to if you can't rely on us as people who believe in the truth claims of the church uh, rely on this this grand master of, of, of this knowledge has been passed down over generations way, way before Joseph Smith claimed to have seen God the Father and Jesus Christ you know before he began his his ministry there there have been excellent thinkers who have been talking about this topic and and, and lean on them if, if you can't lean on us right now uh, lean on this this wonderful uh, this wonderful man uh, in, in this aspect of his life, at least his, his advice um, to, to view this negativity. And what I, what I've learned is we can actually compartmentalize all of the negativity, all of the trauma, all of the, the suspected abuse that you've experienced that I've experienced. And I've been through a lot myself. Uh, I, I don't share a lot of my, my, my past, my, my negative energy that I've experienced. But you can, you can actually box it all up, all of the negativity from your past and say, I'm going to label this box negativity instead of all my negative negativity and feeling shame for all of that negative, that the compounding negativity that I've experienced, I'm going to box it all up in one big box. And I'm going to start right now in this very moment, be present and say, I, I recognize that past of neg negative negativity. I see it. I see you, but I'm labeling you as is just negativity and it's a neutral feeling it's a neutral position i'm not negative about my negativity my negative past my dark past that i've had i'm going to let let that just sit there and i'm going to examine it as if it's outside of me it's not in me it's just uh it's just there it's it's passing through my my mind and my heart and i do not need to allow that to sink deep into the fibers of my being uh, and define who i am going to be from this moment going forward throughout the day. Now, if I have additional things that remind me of my past, I examine those as they come through. Uh, and I'm reminded often as a personal ex experience, I'm, re I'm reminded often of my uh, serious faith crisis when I go to church and I, and I see members in my ward family who have, are, are simple believers. They have beautiful, simple faith. They believe uh, in, things that probably aren't as accurate as they probably could believe. And, and, I, and, I, and I begin to see that negative negativity rising within me and, and, and criticizing and belittling them in my mind, in my heart. But instead, I, I, I'm, I'm not allowing that to control what could be perceived as very negative, uh, triggering even in my church meetings. And it, it takes a lot of practice, but we can help with this process uh, within an LDS or Latter-day Saint uh, context. We are here to help to apply this, this long-standing truth that uh, this, this Tibetan master, a Buddhist master has provided us uh, here. So that's my, mm. my, my, my plea uh, at this point is to allow people to, to lean on him, people like him, and then come to us and as you begin to trust some of these principles that we apply in Uplift. Yeah, that's really great, Leo. And I, I also think um, I agree with you that that um, the some of the Eastern philosophies are really valuable for us to draw on. Um, yes. And we're told to meditate and ponder as members of the church. And I think we don't really do that enough. Sometimes we get so bogged down in, in thinking about our problems or our challenges or our doubts or... or the negativity that we get, we get so drawn up 
into that but we we don't have to become part of it or let it become part of us we can step back from it and mindfulness is a great tool for stepping back and observing your experience mm -hmm. and not necessarily letting it control you or letting it dictate to you how you're going to respond to it so mm -hmm. You can see yourself as a spiritual being independent of that doubt, of that unbelief, of that, um, of those challenging things. And um, you don't even have to see negativity as, as negative. It just it is simply a thing. Um, it doesn't have to be a thing that, that consumes you. Right. Right. Yeah, so, exactly. so in Buddhist philosophy, it's um, everything is neutral. If, uh, mm -hmm. if you start to... to to buy into things too much, then they 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 can take take over, and you can forget that you are actually a higher being than than what, what than the mortality that we're bogged down in. But we need to kind of let that go and and just see it for what it is. Yeah, observation and breathing. I love to breathe. Uh, my my three children. Uh, have have learned initially that was like oh dad i don't want to do 10 more breaths you know as they're laying in bed getting ready for sleep uh, <laughs> they say just sing me a song or rub my feet and i don't want to breathe and it's work and uh -huh. we've broken through that and uh the old my littlest one even uh jones is his name my littlest one he actually does a little bit of breathing with me he's only three you know <laughs> i say breathe deep and he <laughs> big breaths in and out and and uh we've done some uh visual imagery uh you know relaxation techniques and and this is all part of of uh, all truth i believe being circumscribed into one great whole uh that we talk about mm. this over overarching truth of of pulling from all the great resources that we have all around the world uh and and so i'm i'm an advocate for for utilizing every good thing that we can find uh you know lay hold on those good things and this is one of those good things that an uplift that we are bringing in and we'll talk about this with you openly. So we can move on. We're talked about about uh, our friend here, Chogyam, quite a bit, and we appreciate what he's done. His uh, uh, he's a he's a good a good uh, good thinker, and I, I really do appreciate uh, what he's he's shared with us. And that's this this particular concept, and for me especially, has been tremendous. It's provided so much healing in my life. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so. We're going to talk now, again, kind of going back from negative back to positive, to light, uh, restorative to, uh, restorative light. And this is a personal experience. And so I, I'll ask Kara, can you actually uh, start us off here? Sure. Regarding church history, I used to be re really troubled by what I perceived to be a rocky path of negligence, poor decisions and contradictions. Truth be told, some people are quite talented at pointing out these things, and I held on to an uncharitable perspective for a very long time. Thank you. Although, as I have pondered and prayed about the restoration, I'm beginning to see our history and our leaders differently. I invite you, the listener, to imagine something, something with me. Let's imagine the church as a large room filled with many beautiful things things we all want to appreciate and enjoy. Yet, instead of radiating a complete, brilliant light, like the celestial room of the temple, this large room isn't very bright. If you walked into this room, you'd sense some darker areas, with certain areas feeling noticeably brighter than the rest. You can go ahead, Kara. You see, as Joseph and Emma began to restore the church, it's as though they received a small candle and were encouraged to share that light. Thinking back, we can now imagine them together, inching forward in the dark, walking by the patient grace of God, tenderly lighting a few more candles during their difficult mortal sojourn. So now, instead of criticizing them, I try to imagine them walking slowly, earnestly trying to distribute this gift of light and laying the foundation for future generations to seek greater light. Our general leaders since Joseph and Emma have worked hard to add more light to this large, dimly lit room. But even today, we 
have areas of the room that remain in relative darkness. In fact, we find an enormous host of imperfect members and leaders who are stumbling around trying to see and enjoy the many beautiful things, but are limited because of the dim lighting. Don't get me wrong, I absolutely believe that compared to many parts of the world, our church is relatively bright. That's because of beautiful things like priesthood ordinances, the gift of the Holy Ghost, and the gospel fullness we find in the Book of Mormon. But this relative beauty doesn't mean our church is as bright as it could or should be. There are pockets within our church that are still dark, and we're still patiently pleading for and working toward the time when Christ will bring us further light. With every big policy update, with every improvement to our manuals, with every word and deed motivated by charity, with every child who feels the love of Jesus, our beautiful church inches a little further along the covenant path toward Christ. This is because God continues to patiently work through fallible humans to reveal many great and important things pertaining to his kingdom. The restoration isn't complete, and there is plenty of light and knowledge that our heavenly parents want to share with us. We're all fallen and weak, but this shouldn't discourage us from seeking additional light. We need to learn how to look charitably upon those who went before us and those who lead us today. Could you or I have done a better job? How can we be sure without experiencing what they experienced? Our past leaders were operating with limited light. Our current leaders are in the same predicament. They are doing the best they can, anxiously engaged to lead us back into the presence of the greatest light of all, our radiant Redeemer, Jesus Christ. So, I now see changes in our church as additional light, not as harmful mistakes, wrong paths, or contradictions. Because of this brighter, more charitable, charitable perspective, the challenges we have faced and face today are easier for me to comprehend. I mourn with those who mourn, but I also feel, feel a need to rejoice. I'm at peace in Christ because of the light we have received and the growing pattern of light I see as I patiently participate in our beautiful church. With great love, I invite you to do the same. So uh, that's the last of that uh, section. Any thoughts there, Cara? I think that's just beautiful. Um, I think that that is that follows beautifully on from the discussion of negativity because that is that demonstrates how you turned around that negativity and used it as a platform for building um, greater understanding. And I, I love that, that uh, metaphor of light. I think that all light emanates from the Savior and he wants us to have greater light. And even though that light may be dim in our lives at the moment, he wants to lead us towards greater light. And that greater light is found in the restored gospel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we, we've come a long way, I would say, uh, especially in the last few years. You know, we've been on a roll <laughs> with our dear prophet. He is just, he's receiving a lot of great light. And, uh, and sometimes it feels like a few candles are put out. Uh, and, you know, we empathize, we sympathize with that, that uh, mindset and that, that perspective. We understand when particular policies or movements in the church feel backward. Uh, and the only thing I can suggest there is that we remember that we can't see, number one, we can't see uh, what God sees, obviously. He is above all. He knows. All, uh, all of us are in his hands. He is taking care of us, uh, and he's ready to bless us and to heal us and to help us. And he uh, he can see it all, and he is in control. But as part of that process of of bringing us into his presence and helping us to become like him, he works through uh, 
uh, very human people. And he's doing an amazing job if you think about it. We all make a lot of mistakes. And uh, so this process of revelation and of restorative light is a beautiful thing if you think about uh, the, pro the direction, the general direction that we're going. Uh, look back in our history. Look at the challenges. Look at the apparent discrepancies and the contradictions and things that we, we struggle with so much. But look at the clarity that we have today, the relative clarity. We still have a lot of areas where we need more information. We need additional revelation and the, the restoration like we talked about. Of, well, the gospel has been restored, the basics of the gospel, and that's clearly taught. But the church itself and the, and the truths that are yet to be revealed are, are, are something to look forward to. And that's instead of seeing it as, of, as, as contradictions or a large paradox, we can see those things as just little added measure of light each time we see some of yeah, these, that's this a, progress. Yeah, that's a great, great way of describing it. Yeah, I, I think um, also Elder Bedner uh, described the process of receiving light and that process happens differently for different people. So um, it's, it's really the process of, of um, receiving a testimony. For some people that just um, is a sudden sudden stroke of light and, and we've probably had those moments but more often it's a gradual dawning of light and um, as you as you come out of the darkness you can begin to see more that you couldn't see before so mm -hmm. yeah I think that light is a really really great metaphor for, for, for personal revelation yeah and, and you know I think about my own past and, and and invite everyone to do the same who's listening. What kind of dumb mistakes have you made? I, I, I'll tell you one of mine. Uh, I, when I was a young, I don't know, nine year old kid, old enough to know better. I was out with a bunch of kids uh, that I thought were really cool. And we were at some kind of birthday party and I lived in downtown Salt Lake and we, we walked over to this, someone suggested we walked over to explore this construction site, apartment buildings. And I went over there and the kids, some of the kids started throwing rocks at the, at the, this building that they were constructing. No one was there. It was like a Saturday and so no one was working and, and, and we started throwing rocks at the building. Uh, and I broke some windows, uh, very large, beautiful windows of that apartment building. And, and that was a really dumb thing to do. And I hid that from my, my dear father and mother for, I think for like, a, it seemed like a year or, or maybe even more. I went home from that party. Oh, all was great. It was a great time. But I knew deep down that that was wrong. I, I felt it deep in my bones. I carried that with me uh, for a long time. And one day it was funny that this, this uh, parent of my, one of my friends in passing was like to my mom one day, she's like, hey, remember when our, our sons broke those windows? <laughs> <laughs> and, and my mom was like, your what? Poor <laughs> I'm sure her heart just stopped at that point. Like, what? My, my son all that time ago? And so my dad <laughs> took me out to lunch later that day. And I was surprised, you know, excited. Oh, look, we're going to go out to eat some fun lunch. And he took me out and bless his soul. A kindest man. Uh, the way he approached me in that moment was a beautiful thing. He asked me gently and asked me about um, if I had any memory of what happened. And, uh, and I came clean, uh, knowing, I, knowing I was caught. And so long story short, he paid the, the, the price for the, the window, a beautiful example of my savior in that moment for me to take that burden. He wrote a check, um, took care of that, went and visited the man, shook his hand. And I felt a wave of peace come over me. But I, the point of this is I don't look back at my nine-year-old self and say, with my, with my limited light that I had and say, oh, how stupid and how ugly and how wrong and horrible of a, of a person I was. I can't do that to myself. That's not fair. It's not honest. I was operating on limited light. I knew better, but I made a mistake. And, and that's what happens. That's what's happened in our church. We've, we've, had, we've broken some windows. Uh, we need to be honest about that. We are honest about that and uplift. We've done some things, said some things that are just, just don't feel right. And, um, but we don't sit and criticize. 
and condemn because of the lack of light that we, we had and lack of experience. Our leaders today, uh, the, the Quorum of the Twelve, the other leaders, the general leaders, the women especially, they are filled with light and truth. And they're beautiful people, mm. beautiful souls. And you can feel that in them. And mm. they are not making huge mistakes at this point. They, there are things that are happening that are still we're struggling with to understand the mind and will of God and understand exactly why our leaders are doing such things. But you can sit and, and, and listen and feel of their true uh, capacity, deep capacity to understand the mind and will of God to a greater degree, not a perfect degree, but to a greater degree than earlier leaders uh, could. So that's my personal example. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. I, I love that story. And in a way, we're all that nine-year-old, aren't we? And, and that still. in our church is that, is that nine-year-old. Yeah, and yeah. And, and the, the Savior is, is a gentle, loving Father who paid the price mm -hmm. for those mistakes that we didn't even comprehend were happening at the time, but mm -hmm. he redeemed us in a way that we couldn't do ourselves. Mm -hmm. And um, so just as he does that for us individually, as imperfect little nine-year-olds, he has also done that for the church. So where mistakes have been made, where, where there's been less than Christ-like behavior, um, then he has redeemed us already through his atonement. And all we have to do is trust. So I think that's a beautiful metaphor. That's going to stay with me for a long time. Thank you for sharing that story. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm grateful it happened, uh, even though it was a, a dark year of, of, of sh a shameful year. I mean, I remembered that thing and tried to dig, you know, try to bury it deep. <laughs> <laughs> in the recesses yeah. of my heart, but it was there. I knew exactly what my dad, the first few words out of his mouth, I knew exactly what he was going to say. Uh, and I could just sense it. Uh, and uh, I was surprised, you know, like, how did you find out? But, <laughs> but I, I, it was definitely um, a good experience for me overall. I mean, I feel bad what I did, but, but I, but that's, that's what this is all about is it's, it's journey. Uh, we're on this journey together. The church is the people. We are the church. Uh, we are um, we are not separated from the church. It's it's us, yeah, and so we we can uh, take responsibility and and try to keep moving forward, and but not to beat ourselves up over um, the mistakes. To not be negative about our negativity. So yeah, and just as just as the the Savior extends grace to us, and just as your Father extended grace to you, that puts us under greater responsibility to extend grace to others exactly. and also to ourselves because we can't hold grudges we can't we can't remain in anger if if god has forgiven us right right and be patient with the lack of light and, and more will come uh, uh that's that's for sure if you don't believe it just look at all the the wonderful things that are happening and that have happened the love of the love past year. I mean, it's just, it's a tremendous time to be here and to be part of this church. Uh, okay. So we're going to answer this question here. Is renewed faith possible? Uh, do you want to read this for us? Yeah. The first and key point of recovery is when the active member shares concerns with family, friends, and leaders. Instead of treating that person harshly, our membership and our leaders must learn to treat him or her with empathy, compassion, and unconditional love. These struggling members must be embraced to make clear they are wanted and needed, doubts and all. Mm -hmm. This comes from our nice uh, faith crisis report that we've linked to before. Everyone will probably remember that uh, big chart with all of the reasons why people leave the church and the top reasons are losing faith and or just losing belief in, in the history of the church and Joseph Smith. Uh, those are the top reasons. And then being offended is the very bottom. That's the same study. And this is a key finding from that study uh, that that we want to highlight uh, as we talk now a little bit more toward the believing members of the church who are here to learn about doubt 
and about faith crisis and about what what it means that their spouse or their child or even their parents in some cases uh, have decided to leave the church behind and even leave God behind. Uh, I This is very close to near, near dear to my heart. I wish I knew that my current self was back in my my old self um, years ago when a dear family member uh, was all alone. And I wish also that I didn't have to go through it myself. Uh, but of course I did. And, and, and I've learned from all of this, but man, I just, I just can't tell you all who are listening how important this is to have this information now about our loved ones. And if you're, mm-hmm. if you're, if, even if it's, if it's late, you're late in the game and you have someone who has virtually completely decided against the church and there just seems like there's no chance. Um, there are some nuggets of truth in here that you can hang on to. Uh, we must embrace these loved ones with unconditional love, full compassion with empathy. And if empathy isn't clear, we can talk more about that with people, but we've got to be ready for these people and not treat them as, uh, as though they have a disease. Uh, and mm. Patrick Mason's great in his book. At the end of his book, he talks about uh, not treating these people as, as though they, uh, you know, basically that they have a disease. We, we would run to someone's aid if they're sick. And, um, and we don't need to talk, you know, reference as much about uh, saving people from their condition necessarily. We, we, we know that's implied in, in our doctrine of the rescue and of helping people, but we want to embrace these people, uh, doubts and all, to love them and to listen to them. And this is such an important shift in our thinking as members of the church and as leaders. And there's a lot of great information out there that's talking a lot about this right now, books and things. But this is just really important for us. Any thoughts there, Cara? Yeah, I think that um, compassion is really important because we all struggle with something. And even if faith is not our struggle, then something else will be. And we need to extend the same compassion towards others in their faith struggles as we would uh, like to have ourselves, um, regardless of, of what our individual struggle might be.